Hi, I'm James J. Hughes. I'm Associate Provost at uh, University of Massachusetts, Boston, and the Executive Director of the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technologies. Uh, the IET uh, that I run has programs in Boston and in Turin, Italy. We work on human enhancement, artificial intelligence, genetic engineering, those kinds of questions. Well, the term cyborg comes from a paper that was written by two guys for NASA back in 1962. And they were thinking about the problem of astronauts going crazy in space and um, imagined a, uh, a suit that they could wear that would have telemetry back to ground zero, uh, ground control, and that ground control, if they noticed that an astronaut was losing it somehow, they could get, inject them with drugs. So that was the original idea of a cyborg, a kind of human machine interface that um, had some kind of uh, feedback loop. And it's taken on a broader meaning, of course. It's any kind of augmentation of the human being with uh, artificial intelligence, prosthetics, and so forth. So prosthetic limbs would be a part of the cyborg discussion. But I've been especially interested in the questions of brain-machine interfaces, uh, moral enhancement, the use of drugs and devices to change moral cognition and so forth. So that would be another example of a cyborg enhancement. Yes, um, I think that there's always a possibility of inequality becoming worse. And, but I think the problem that most um, people who approach this topic have is that they tend to focus on the technology as if that's the driving force. And the real question is, technologies tend to have disruptive effects on social relations and um, they provide new opportunities for egalitarian demands or for social movements. Um, you know, classic example is that um, knights on horseback with armor were extremely good at uh, pressing peasants and then uh, other knights invented the crossbow as a way to get through from a distance that armor and then brigands and revolutionaries and rebels were able to use the crossbow. So it doesn't, the crossbow could have had, you know, if it had been only monopolized by knights, the way that swords and armor were, um, it could have had an egalitarian effect, but it had a kind of mixed effect because it was used by everybody. So I think <clears throat> the thing that we have to pay attention to in the future is, and, and kind of the guiding principle for the things that we write at the IAT is, look, these are the things that we want to avoid, and these are the th possible benefits that we could get from this technology, and let's steer away from this and towards this. And that's usually more um, techno-optimistic than a lot of what academia produces on these questions. Well, let's start with the human uh, question, and this goes back to your, what are the risks of being a cyborg? Um, <clears throat> I think a lot of people are skeptical of the idea of extensive physical augmentation of the human. It's a trope of our popular culture that, you know, lumbering cyborg walks in the room and they're, you know, not your friend. Um, but I don't think that there's any intrinsic, I, in the first place, we have to define what is the human aspect here that we're trying to preserve. And that's why I'm especially focused on the questions of brain augmentation and moral enhancement because I think it's possible that we could have um, augmentations that do change fundamental human mental characteristics that we want to preserve, like empathy. Um, you know, you could imagine <clears throat> uh, a kind of cyborg aug augmentation of a soldier that would reduce their empathy in the battlefield so they could just be a, a perfectly good killing machine. We wouldn't want that to be generalized. Um, so I think there are some things that we want to consciously preserve um, and, and maintain. But um, I've always been a transhumanist since I discovered the term. And the key idea of transhumanism is that we can radically change as a species, become um, very different beings, and still preserve key aspects of the things we want to preserve, our sense of play or growth, flourishing, happiness, whatever the things are that you think are essential about being a human. I don't think that the biological uh, base human is essential for, for those goods. I think we're going to face um, a lot of situations where um, intellectual property rights about these technologies or the 
uh, profit-making motive runs up against the public good. And we saw that in the 90s, for instance, with antiretroviral drugs. Um, when they were first invented, cost $40,000 a year to treat somebody with HIV. Um, and of course, I was out of the reach of people in the developing world. So uh, Brazil, South Africa, India said, well, look, we need to give these drugs to our people and we're just gonna start making them if you don't give us the, the right kind of licensure. And eventually they got better licensure and they also reverse engineered those drugs. So I think we're gonna face that situation. An enhancement by definition is something that most people will probably want um, and or many people will want. And so uh, in the developing world, they're gonna want it too. Um, and so there's no point in saying, well, this is something that is currently so expensive or out of reach that we should be banning it. It's the question is, how can we make sure that everybody who wants it can get it? Yeah, I believe in the extended cognition model, people like Andy Clark, which would argue that the beginning of our cyborg life if, if you want to push it back as far as possible, it's fire. Fire allowed us to cook food that allowed our prefrontal cortexes to grow. And so there was this kind of feedback loop between fire and intelligence. But um, when we got about 50,000 years ago or 30 or whatever it was, when we invented literacy, this was the point at which we were able to download the contents of our mind onto external media and upload them again later. And um, so I think that for me is kind of the marker of the beginning of cyborgization. One of the things that <clears throat> we've been concerned about for 200 years um, is whether machines would displace human beings from labor and whether that would be a positive future or a negative future. Um, and we really haven't seen it um, and we still don't really see it. Uh, it's possible that there are occupations we haven't Im imagined yet that it will take longer for machines to catch up to. Um, but I think one of the central questions, and especially with the rapidity of uh, the development of these tools, is um, whether we're going to see technological unemployment in the short term, which, you know, 10, 20 years. And I, I think we probably will, um, and I think that we need to be consciously thinking about what a better future with less work will look like, how we can redistribute unemployment, as it were, make sure that everyone um, still has access to the goods of life, uh, even though the labor market radically changes. And of course, I'm in higher education, so the, the typical higher education explanation or a response to this is, well, we just need to provide re job retraining and things like that, but a technological unemployment scenario is one where not only are things changing so fast you don't know what to train them in, but that in general they, the, the amount of um, employment will be shrinking. Now the way it fits with cyborgization is that for the foreseeable future, um, most occupations will not be simply displaced, but it will be human beings using machines in ways that expand and complement their own labor. And that can create unemployment because if one person starts to do 10 times as much work, then there are nine other people who may not be necessary in that occupation. So um, cyborgization could have uh, uh, similar effects just to automation in general, um, that cyborgization could reduce the amount of employment overall. <laughs> I have a, a perhaps quixotic and outdated faith in the power of the democratic state. And so my goal um, at a kind of geopolitical level is to strengthen transnational institutions and eventually hopefully have a world order in which everyone's human rights are protected and liberal democracy is instantiated as opposed to authoritarianism, um, <clears throat> where we collectively ensure security against invasion and genocide um, and where we have uh, policies that ensure general prosperity. So, you know, do I see that happening now? No, um, you know, we're in a new Cold War with China and that's gonna, and, and Russia and North Korea. And, um, uh, and then a lot of the developing world is just kind of sitting back right now and waiting to see how it turns out. So um, I think we need a new uh, global, globalist vision um, about what a, a prosperous and beneficial world would look like. And that relates to the AGI question in terms of what we were talking about this morning in, in the panels uh, or in the, the talks we were given this morning. 
sing the singleton idea. We need, you know, we're either going to get a superintelligence, which is going to have these kinds of impacts on the world, or we're going to get some hybrid of human, uh, be, you know, human interests and collectivity and accountability with that kind of AI. Um, so I pay close attention to, for instance, the automation of government services, where I think some of these things are beginning to happen. Um, you know, automated case management and social work, um, automation of military affairs. Um, and I think that in the long term, uh, we probably will have some amalgam of governance and AI that uh, would be more or less democratic. But, you know, of course, then the question is, how, w will those AIs have interests of their own and w how will we contend with that? And um, how do we contend with the proliferation of AIs in a society that might undermine the capacity of any govern government to govern? I don't think we can. And if you go back to um, Werner Vinge's essay on the singularity, which he wrote in 1982, um, he, the first part of the essay is about uh, intelligence explosion and AI and ASI. The second part of the essay is about intelligence augmentation, and he says the only hope we have is to augment the human being so that we kind of ride the, you know, <laughs> ride the wave. Um, and so that gets back to the cyborg question and brain machine interfaces. Um, and uh, for better or worse, this is something that uh, Elon Musk has been explicit about, that he is one of the rationales for him promoting Neuralink is that he thinks that we need those kinds of technologies in order to keep humans in the loop of control. I'm not sure whether we actually will stay in the loop of control, but I agree with the general proposition. Well, uh, as I said, I'm, I've been working for far too long on the topic of moral enhancement. and. <clears throat> My schema for moral enhancement has expanded into various virtues that I think should be focused on as um, at least deficits that we could correct or potentially excellences that we could cultivate. And um, I'm open to a wide variety of methodologies for moral enhancement. The discussion originally started with things like drugs, um, oxytocin, serotonin, and so forth. Um, but it's increasingly obvious to me that um, even before we get anything in our head, any kind of machinery in our head, um, that we are surrounded by what we call the exocortex. Um, we have electronic uh, uh, versions of you know, digital twinning going on in terms of uh, downloading or offloading parts of our mental processes to our machines. And the, these machines then become part of our extended cognition. So to the extent that we want to morally enhance people, that's probably the first place to focus because it's the least um, invasive, dangerous thing to do. You know, taking a drug or a gene therapy or putting a machine in your head is pretty invasive. So I'm very interested in ways that, um, for instance, digital twins or um, AI agents that are trained on us and are, are trying to be our agents in the world, um, that they could incorporate various kinds of moral capacities or even our spiritual interests. Um, you know, I am a Buddhist. Um, I should be meditating more. Um, I don't meditate as much as I would like. If I could uh, somehow figure out how to program my environment to remind me, to create spaces for me to meditate, that could be quite useful. Um, <clears throat> whether uh, One of the things I think will eventually happen is that brain-machine interfaces will not only be um, sensory devices for the feedback of information, but they will also be able to stimulate various parts of our neural architecture. And we are increasingly focused, we increasingly understand which parts of the neural architecture create experiences such as um, timelessness or oneness with the environment or, um, you know, transcendent compassion and things like that. So, um, the degree to which we eventually have that kind of control of the brain, we could you know, say every day at five, give me five seconds of universal compassion or whatever. Which is, if you go back and read uh, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep by uh, Philip K. Dick, he imagines a future in which people have that machine in their, in their apartments. They can hold on to it and, and it, it suffuses them with a feeling of universal compassion for all sentient beings. 
um, whether that's, he, he saw that as a dystopian <laughs> technology, but for me it's like, well, that doesn't sound so bad. I mean, for people to have that experience every once in a while. Well, I'm excited about um, a future where people don't have to work to live. I think that that could be a very good future um, if, we figure, if we make the cultural and psychological adjustments that I think we probably will. Um, and I'm also excited about the capacity to um, uh, fulfill the technological fantasies and visions that we've had for a long time. I think probably we won't be able to get off this planet in these meat sacks that we currently have without radical re-engineering, and I think AGI might accelerate some of that, and so enable uh, space colonization. Um, I think it would be very interesting to um, just understand the space of all possible minds through this kind of experimentation. You know, is it possible? We, we only have the experience of the biological minds that came about through evolution, but the space of minds is so much bigger than that, and so if we meet minds that have you know, vast intelligence but no ego or you know, whatever combinations we can imagine. Um, that could be very illuminating for our own development. We may um, discover directions that we want to go ourselves. <laughs>